I remember that first August. Like I moved into that apartment in like April. Yeah. The first check in that first August I cut from Underdog was like 55k. And I was like, holy fuck. I ended up pulling in multi six figures that year. You can be well off very early on. I think you could be legitimately a full-time content creator with between 10 and 15,000 YouTube subscribers. How would I do it again? I would go into it knowing that it's gonna take me 10 fucking years to do it again. Cause it just took me 10 years to get to where we are. My first six figure raise, cool shiny object syndrome at first, after a little bit of time, it, that wears off immediately. Totally. But it, but it's like, what other choice do you have? You're gonna live an unhappy life for your whole life without being able to fully fucking express yourself? Quickly. I think people have a problem cutting things out quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you know that you hate this fucking thing, yeah. you got a job for six weeks and you hate that shit, get out the job. Yeah. If you feel like you're not making content that just straight up is like helping people, if it's not like something in your core and you're like going out there to help people and give people value, all that tactic -y shit is not gonna help you. Kind of powerful quote the other the other day that was like um it, it was something i'm gonna butcher it probably but it, it was like potential people people put potential on other people in the sense that they are only thinking about what they would do if they were in their position it's right like, it's like when someone says like you're not yeah. living up to your potential or whatever it's like you're only living up to what you would do if you were in my position. I absolutely ruined that because when when I heard it the first time, yeah. I was like, that was cool. You're like, that shit hit, like, bro. I can't repeat it. Yeah, but it was something along the lines of like when other people say something about potential or something along those lines, like they are just uh, projecting onto you what they would do in, in your shoes. And a lot of that is us being in this, you know, creative space. Right. We just like a lot of different things. And, and like yeah. a normal person does kind of like live for the weekends. And that's fine because I yeah. think we were both probably there at one point in our life. Yeah, and totally. I'm, like, I'm just focusing on something else. So I look at myself as like maybe I'm missing out on what you think is cool right now. What? Yeah. But also in five years, you're probably going to really, really wish that you had built something and, and put a lot of, you know, your energy into something worthwhile. Right. Right. Yeah. It's two sided. I, I totally agree with that. Uh, okay, so before we dive into everything, you've we've talked a bit about you, BDGE. Give me a breakdown of everything you're doing and everything that you've built till now, because then I want to dive into afterwards, like how you would do it from scratch if you started today and get into some advice and, and everything when it comes to really content creation and building a business off of it. So where are you right now? So right now, you mean physically? <laughs> we, are, we are physically in New York. Okay. Uh, we are in- 36th Street. The B chill, Daddy. We'll have people show up. Uh, <laughs> we are in the BDGE Times Snapback office. Yeah, we are a team of uh, about six or seven people. Um, I think six full time, maybe two, three, four contractors or whatnot. It goes all the way back to when I was, I think, like eighteen, nineteen, maybe when I right. started. Right. It started because me and my friends were in a fantasy football league together in high school. Super intense league. Loved everything about it. I kept winning it, you know, maybe four of the first five years. And I was like, oh, I'm kind of nice at this. Yeah, thing, yeah. You know? So I was like, am I genuinely deep down? I was like, I just want to teach people to be better at this because I'm so fucking good at it. Looking back at like the first stuff I put out. Oh, God. If I saw myself Everybody. Online, I would never, I would never watch another piece of content right. from, from early me. But it was just a genuine like, man, I, I love this thing. I'm very passionate about it. I want to teach people to be better at it. Started blogging. This is how long ago I started making content when like blogging was actually like the superior outlet for people. Realized real quickly, hated it. So I was like, I'd rather make videos. I'm way more comfortable in front of a camera, just like expressing myself this way. And I started to make videos. And naturally I was like, man, where can I put these? YouTube was like the place. It was, sure, yeah. it wasn't at that time. It was not like a business minded decision. It was just like, I literally don't know where else. What year was videos. this? This was probably 2014, maybe 2014, 2015. Okay. Yeah. Started putting out videos. Didn't really take it seriously. Uh, loved doing it, but I didn't take it seriously because I was nervous, man. Like putting yourself out there totally, and you know, putting it out there for like the world to judge your friends, you know, that whole outside element of it is so tough when you're beginning. So the first bunch of videos I made, I didn't even tell anybody I was making them. I just like put them out and kind of saw what happened. And eventually what I happened literally nothing. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was, it literally nothing happened. No one saw them. Uh, there was a little bit of like organic growth, which I'm like glad that I did that 
because I saw that there was something there and I was really scared at the time. Looking back, it's like so silly how nervous you are about other people's judgment that don't fucking like matter right. whatsoever. And the first few I did that were outward facing to like people I knew I did with friends because I was like, if I can get them in, then it's a little less scary for me totally. to actually like put myself out there. Did that. And, you know, going back to the conversation we had in the last podcast, it was like, they're clearly not even close to as invested into this as I am, which is of, of course the case. Cause I was making videos already. Yeah, totally. So what videos, were, what kind of videos were those? They were fantasy video, fantasy okay. football videos yeah, yeah, yeah. where we would like break down. We would do like mock drafts, like three Got of us you. or whatever. Yeah. And it, it was fun. And I, I like wish my friends were like, so as into it as, as I was at the time, regardless, uh, Started making the videos, took it like kind of seriously, whatever, summer after summer, and started to get some organic traction. And I was like, man, I wonder what would happen if I like really went all in on this. Mm -hmm. I wonder what would happen if like day in, day out, I just worked my ass off for even just one summer. Yeah. So I did that. And things didn't like blow up relative to where I was. I probably went from like a couple hundred subscribers on YouTube up to like 5,000 ish, where at that time that was, you know, and I was also like very, very young. I was 21, maybe 22 by myself. Like didn't know anyone else. Out of college? Like, just out of college, yeah. Like, freshly out of college, started right after that. Um, and I didn't, I didn't have any content creators, like, in my, you know, in, in my network, in my ecosphere. So this was, like, not human to me, really, right? Yeah. And, um, and then I was like, okay, there's, there's something here. But that wasn't anywhere near enough, obviously, to, like, sustain myself financially or whatever. So right. I got into the marketing world, uh, like, full-time corporate stuff. Still continue to do the content on the side, and just built it up over the years and experimented with a bunch of different things. But like day in, day out, you know, I've been doing this now going back to 2014, like damn near 10 years that yeah. I started. Right. And it wasn't always as serious as it is now, but like experimenting and fucking around and understanding that I needed to be serious. It's a span of 10 years. And I can probably like count on my two hands, the number of days that I've just completely taken off from doing it. So it is so much consistency that needs to be there to show up every day to learn what it takes not to do in order to get to where you want to go and whatever. I eventually like built up enough momentum to the point where I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to jump into this thing yeah. full time or at least freelance on the side of the things I was working on in the corporate world. And I had momentum. I had enough momentum where I was like, all right, one more year of this shit. And I have a little bit more time. If I'm not in an office working, I think I could get there. Fortunately, um, things kind of like took off for me that summer after I left my last corporate job. And then that was maybe six or seven years ago. Yeah. And, you know, throughout the years, I've just been trying to get my friends a little bit more involved. We got our first office space two years ago. The leash just came up and that's why we got this office space now because I became close with Jack over the couple of years right. and just figured, you know, it's cool. Like, fuck it. Let's just do like a roommate thing where we're splitting everything. And it makes sense. Yeah. So now you got BDGE, but you got a couple accounts. So, right. You got BDGE trivia. Mm hmm. So is that, are those, is that all the accounts? So we have, so basically the way we're looking at our, our kind of like business now is we built it off of YouTube fantasy football stuff. And I always love the behind the scenes stuff. I always loved like the lifestyle stuff because I was really inspired by YouTubers back in the day. I don't know if you're familiar with like Christian Guzman or yeah. Max Tuning. Those guys, like I used to love watching their shit and they started doing like fitness nutrition videos. And I went through a phase of that in my life and they taught me a lot. And then they started to like segue their content into more lifestyle behind the scenes, like watching them build their business around yeah, building yeah, yeah. their YouTube channel. And I was like, it's like the Gary, it's like the Gary V. Yeah. I was like, this whole thing is crazy and so cool that we get to like watch it happen real time in front of us while they document everything. And I was like, I could do this. Like, I know I can do this. I don't know how long it's going to take, but like, I'm, this is what I'm doing. Right. Like, right. I, I just like had that thought in my mind. And I was like, there's just no way I don't end up there eventually. So that was like my inspiration for it. So it was all fantasy football to start with, with some vlogs on the side, just like documenting myself personally. On the same channel? Yep, same fucking channel. It would be like... And it was called BDGE? It was called... It was my name for like six years. It okay. It was just Nick Ercolano for like the first six or seven Got years. It. And I would put out like top 25 running back rankings for this year. And the yeah. next day would be like a vlog. Like, ah, fuck. I, like right. I signed a client for $1,000 to run their Facebook. You know what I mean? It was just like all over the place. It was ridiculous. Um, now we are much more concentrated as like a business where I made the, the choice to, to transfer it over once we hired people full time from Nick Ercolano to BDGE. Cause I wasn't trying to build, like I'm hiring all you guys to amplify me. Like I'm, right. I'm just like trying to build something cool with other people yeah. that they feel, they feel like they can express their passions. Right. And that's yeah. weird. Like you can't do that. I mean, you can maybe under me, but like not the same thing. So I was like, BDGE is now the business. We are all operating for BDGE. 
And underneath that, there are branches. So I'm trying to build out an infrastructure where it's like, okay, we built BDG fantasy football well and have a lot of lessons learned from that. Now with each new type of content, each new niche, let's like almost replicate what we did for fantasy football in terms of content, product, community. Like let's transfer those over to the new thing. So we have BDG fantasy football. Mm -hmm. We have BDG trivia, NFL trivia. Mm -hmm. We just launched BDG dynasty fantasy football, which is like more of a niche a few weeks ago and it's doing really, really well. And then this upcoming summer, we plan to launch the BDGE DFS or gambling uh, side of things. So you got these different niches. How are you completely brand, like brand new channels? They're all brand new channels, which has been like a major, I would say revelation over the last like year or so. I really think we're moving in a world where like you, you really have to be defined with what you're doing and the audience that you're speaking to. And I think the earlier on you do it, the better off you're going to be long-term very tough early on, right? Like, the YouTube channel that I built out has 120,000 subscribers now. Yeah. And I'm like, all right, let's start this dynasty channel. We're back at zero, but it's, it, it, what, what a lot of people don't understand, especially when you start creating is that that like milestone that you hit, like when we hit our first thousand on the dynasty channel, mm-hmm. I'm just as psyched up as like when we now hit 110,000, right, right. 20,000. I'm like, it's the pursuit. It's the pursuit. And it's like these new little goals are, self-invigorating again so it's scary to start it over but very much the right thing to do long term how long did it take you to get at that what are you guys at now on what on that dynasty channel four thousand and how long has it been i think less than a month so do you think obviously there's some crossover there's people that from the fantasy community that play dynasty and they're going to want to go follow you there uh how much do you think is just your experience and being able to go at it from an experienced mindset uh, into that channel and be able to develop it from there? And how much do you think is just like crossover audience that are following just because they know the brand, they know BDGE? So I would say a lot of it is crossover, Mm -hmm. but we went into a strategy. We went from launching the channel and now we have a system in place where we have five long form videos a week, Monday to Friday going in. And all I'm doing is making one video a week by myself. And we have a group of guys that comes in. We film a batch of them together on every other weekend or whatever. So a lot of it is crossover because we we cross-promoted from our main channel. Yep. So for the first two weeks, we put every video up on YouTube twice. Mm. And we would have an intro saying, hey, this is a Dynasty video. You're going to see it on the the main channel only for the next, you know, three weeks. If you want to keep watching Dynasty stuff, Go over to that channel. Got it. Otherwise, it's going to be here. Whatever. So we pulled a lot of subs over that way. But having the systems in place for the editing, having the systems in place for thumbnails, having the systems in place for how the content creation is going to be made and the scheduling and stuff, I'm not going to know that from the start, obviously. Totally. But for us to hit the ground running zero to five full-time videos a week, like, and I don't think there's been a ton of workload that's been, like, pushed up for anybody, um... So I'm like very proud of how that challenge is going right now. All right, dope. I'll, yeah, I want to get into kind of the nuts and bolts, and you're talking like thumbnails and stuff like that. We'll get sure. into that afterwards. But first off, you know, starting as a content creator and just building up that content, you said you took a job out of college? Yeah. And how long were you at that job for? Dude, so I had, I had like five, legitimately five different full-time jobs, like corporate jobs. Yeah. By the time I was like 23. Like you were just jumping from place to place? I just kept place. quitting places and yeah. moving around places. And they were on marketing? So the first job, I, I wanted to get my MBA out of undergrad. And mm-hmm. I wanted to do that not because like I thought it was something that I really wanted. Trying to buy time? Needed. Yeah, I guess I was just trying to buy time while I was still, like I was pursuing a passion. Yeah. And I realized I was like, okay, I got to take, uh, a I lot of take money. the GMAT, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah I got to take the GMAT. So like the program that I wanted to do started the following September. So I had like six Where? months. Uh, Binghamton. Okay. So I was like, I have six months before I can even like take the GMAT and do this whole thing again, whatever. Might as well get some like work experience. So I started at a very entry level business job, um, which I actually kind of liked. It was like a super normal, like account executive position. Jumped from there because I got a better offer nearer to home. It was like the worst job I've ever had. I left in like six weeks. Damn. Damn. Dude, I was working, it, it was like a, it was like an office of lawyers yeah. and they would call 
people who are owed money in a bankruptcy case. So like uh, if, if like uh, fucking Radio Shack was like one of the clients. Radio yeah. Shack went bankrupt. Yeah, they yeah. owe a bunch of people a bunch of money, but it takes them like 10 years in court to actually get that money. So the lawyers I worked with would call these people and I, on, I would work underneath one of the lawyers. So I would be cold calling people all day and they would be like, hey, we'll buy your debt for like 50% of the price right now. So like, we'll wait the 10 years. Don't worry about it, whatever yeah. it is. But at that job, I hated my, like actually hated my life. I would spend every day, I remember going to the Burger King on the corner of that office, writing up like scripts for my videos for fantasy right. football. Like every single hour that I had free for that would go to that. But I quit within six weeks. So I was like, bro, I'm like actually going to die. I think if, yeah, I, no, yeah. if I stay here, then I got my first marketing job. That's legit hate, by the way. People say they hate their jobs. Like you uh, left in six weeks. Yeah, no, like <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah, and may, maybe I'm a coward for it, but like I, I was. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. like I'm 22. Like I'm not, I'm not wasting my fucking life right now. Yeah, when no. I'm, when I'm passionate about something else, right. you know. Um, so then I got into the marketing world. After that, went to worked at two different agencies, one in New Jersey, one in Manhattan. Mm. Um, learned some like social media marketing. So yeah. face, running Facebook ads, Instagram ads, Twitter ads, things like that, which is what I parlayed into freelancing. When I finally left the corporate world making content, I was able to bring on some clients and run their Facebook, their paid traffic ads. Got you. So, all right, dope. All right, so you, you start creating content on the side and it actually starts doing well. When did you, you always knew that that was going to be your long-term thing. And I think that's why you had success because a lot of people want to see that quick success. And when they don't see it, they quit. Uh, whereas like you, you were kind of in there from the beginning, but as far as, um, really turning, uh, the content into monetization and like seeing that, like, wow, this could be something that I, I could do long-term because they could fund my life. Yeah. Uh, when, what was that point? And like, how did it come about? So the first time I ever made money online was through selling a product, but it wasn't yeah. through, again, it, it came like really, uh, I, I guess natural in a sense. I wanted to figure out a way for my audience to have like a more organized version of what I was saying. Yeah. So I was putting out videos literally every day that one summer I finally started to like jump into it. And I was like, they're like, these videos are 30, 45 minutes long. Sometimes I'm like, man, how can I like make something that is like consumable mm. that just has my best content in it? And so I made my first ever version of like my draft guide, Got which it. is like highly popular now in every like fantasy. Site yeah. Makes it. This was many, many, many years ago. I don't think a lot of people were doing it at the time. So I made this like online magazine per se, and I wasn't even going to sell it. I was just going to give it away, but it, it took me like hundreds of hours to make. So I was like, I'm going to sell it for like five bucks a pop. And I ended up selling it and I sold like hundreds and hundreds of copies of it. And I was like, oh, through shit. YouTube. Yeah. Just through YouTube. At yeah. this time I, I had probably like 7,000, 8,000 subs and I was making, I was starting to make serious money to the point where I was like, okay. With that $5 product. Yes. And I was like, okay, I'm starting to make real money to the point where can't sustain my lifestyle. Definitely not. But momentum wise, like next summer, hell, if I get the right things in place, like if I work harder, I have a bigger audience. I sell this for maybe like 15 bucks instead of five bucks. That's Triple where my it. business mindset started to like kick into place. But I was still working the full-time job at this point. So I was like, I need more time to really focus in on it. Um, so I think that first year monetizing, maybe between like YouTube AdSense probably made a couple thousand dollars off of that. I think ultimately I made about $25,000 that year, which again, not like a full-time salary that you can right. really live off of. But I was like, if I could double that or triple that, I'll be in a pretty good spot there. So what was your game plan then uh, from there? My game plan from there, I left my corporate job and I had clients that I was getting oh, yeah. paid traffic with. Right. So it was like splitting the salary kind of half and half. And I was taking care of you? That was taking care of me, yeah. And I moved into Brooklyn with one of my friends it was Where? my first apartment in Williamsburg oh, nice. um, that I had gotten not living like with my mom or whatever. Yeah. And I remember being like, I remember splitting the rent with him and being like, I, I need you to take like the big portion of it. Cause like, I can't really afford it right now. But by the end of that year, I was like starting to make real money off of the content. We had signed a, a I had signed a nice deal with, uh, they were called draft at the time, but they're now known as underdog fantasy. Mm. And that's where money started to flow in. Cause I had compounding momentum with the draft guide um, started to work with a couple other sponsors. The, the, the subscriber base started to grow from five to 8,000 up to 17,000 to 25,000. And then people in the industry kind of started to take notice. And that was like, my, I, I just tried to stay so like true to my audience that I never sold anything. This was like three years into me making videos. So by the time I signed with an underdog, my audience had so much like loyalty towards me that 
I remember that first August. Like I moved into that apartment in like April. Yeah. The, the first check in that first August I cut from Underdog was like 55K. And I was like, holy fuck. I ended up pulling in multi six figures that year. Yeah. From all of the stuff combined. And I was like, okay, like my the way I was thinking hit. And I don't think that's yeah, necessarily yeah, yeah. practical for everybody just working in like the gambling fantasy space. The way that they pay marketers and affiliates is it's a very high volume. Um, because they put all their money into like marketing and that kind of budget, but that's where we are. So like, that's really all I could talk about. All right. So let's, that's crazy. Let's break that down. So you, you had the draft guy that did very well and you were selling that for five bucks a pop. So you Not obviously the next summer, the next summer we probably bumped it up to like 20, 25. And was that still the only product? Yeah, I think so. Maybe we might've got on Patreon. We might've, we might've got a membership going. Um, I can't really remember to be honest, but okay. But really quadrupling that price you bumped it up to 20 quadruple the price and we'd also been growing pretty much like three to four x our sub base every single year so it went from so then it's a hot the percentage is just increasing that's what i'm saying that's why, the percentage could be that, the same, that's why the, it was like I'm an not. exponential thing where it's yeah, like it's yeah, easy yeah. to look at that and be like holy fuck you made that much money but i also i literally like fucking grinded my eyes out for years before yeah, 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 exactly. there was any return on it it was years of this yeah. before it became that and then what was the brand deal like what did it consist of was it like cpa it was all cpa which I didn't know any better. I didn't realize that companies did anything outside of that. CPA is cost per acquisition. So every time someone used my code to sign up, I yeah. get a kickback of, I think it was $60 at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which again, you're not really going to find that in other industries, I don't think, outside of like super high price products, where a gambling company will look at a customer. You might not think about it. You're like, oh, they're putting down $10, $20 bets. But the lifetime, lifetime. value of a gambling customer might be $1,000. So then when you say, hey, I'm selling a $1,000 product for a company, of course, they're going to give me a $40, $50 kickback. So it makes a little bit more sense that way. And we were doing videos throughout the summer. It was very cyclical where our videos would get really popular in July and August, which is why that check was so big. Like you go, you look at our check in May or fucking January and it might be fucking $400. You know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah, it yeah. It all sets it throughout the, um, throughout the, the cycles of the year. We'd have a video that would go off for 60,000 60, views and we'd get a couple hundred signups off that. So it'd be one video that brings us in, you know, whatever it is, 300 times 50 is, you, you can do the math. Yeah, there, yeah, yeah. It, it was a compounding effect of like, I think me not selling out for so long to right. the point where it was like, when I finally did, people were like, oh, he never does. So what he's saying must be fucking real. Yeah, I like, I like breaking down the monetization aspect of it because a lot of people don't understand that. And they think like all content creators are broke. And obviously not because there's a lot of them doing huge shit but it's not just the massive youtube followers that have a hundred thousand two hundred thousand followers there's a lot of different ways to monetize and so I, I i like breaking that down so with you it came with the product which was the draft guide yep. uh the deals with underdog with the other ones as well yeah we had worked with underdog we had worked with uh monkey knife fight was a different yeah one. i remember that <laughs> that was yeah, crazy monkey knife i remember fight. that um those were like, we, we would try to, we would try to get one, once we got that first big one with underdog, it mm -hmm. was like, okay, this is like the income I, I feel like I should expect and growing yeah. each year. And it was like, we'll try to find one big partnership that really like helps us push through the entire year. And that way we could like focus our energy on really giving value back to that. Brand, right. The right? content. Rather than like, you can hear a lot of podcasts where they're pitching six different products. Yep. In the next podcast, they have six new products. And I'm like, I would never do that. There are a few products we've worked with throughout the years, whether it's like we've worked with Truff Hot Sauce, we've worked with Felix Fire. Gray, the Blue Light uh, glasses. They're all products that we used before working with them. So it's very selective the way that we work together. But a lot of times those like lifestyle-ish brands don't really pay you that much money. Right. So it's like when you could find one that's really willing to invest into you and you feel really aligned with what they're doing and you feel like you can make content for them rather than like having them intrude on your content that typically feels like the right path did you have to turn down so i let's go, even before like going into I'm that open aspect fuck. I'll, I'll answer any questions you have okay you before even talking about having it turned down uh what what was the process of that for someone that's like all right you're, you're creating content did underdog reach out to you at that time there was something else but so i had made videos on their platform i think for like two years before even talking to them and i had posted a clip on twitter of me doing a draft on their platform mm. and there were some comments on it and one someone commented like yo this is this is fucking dope i looked at his profile and it was like vp of marketing at draft and i was uh. like this is so cool i was like 
And now I had never spoken to anyone that was like high up in a company. Like, right. You know, I was literally just a young kid making videos. And I think like the creator economy is so glamorized now that it feels like everyone's super accessible. But at the time I didn't really know any better. Yeah. So I looked at this kid's profile and I was like, oh fuck, he's in Brooklyn. I had just moved into Brooklyn. So I DM'd him and I was like, yo, let's get like a, let's get a drink. Let's get a yeah, little, yeah. like partnership. Let's have a conversation. And they had at the time been owned by the same company that FanDuel was owned by. So they worked in the office together. I went out with, with David Gamby, who I'm close with now. Uh, we, we got drinks and he was like, let me bring you into the office. Let's like this. Let's talk about like a more secure deal. Brought me into like the FanDuel office, which I, at the time I was like, oh my God, like I'm in the Sick. fucking FanDuel office. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, this is so cool. Um, and we had signed the deal. And again, it was like the $60 CPA, no cash up front. Realistically, I didn't know how well it was going to go. And then those summer months came and I was like, okay, my audience loves this fucking, uh, loves this platform or loves what we're doing, loves the product. And I go back to that a lot where I'm like, man, a lot of people think that these sponsors are going to reach out to you. And you, you can get yeah. to the point where you build enough leverage where like we get reached out to all the time right. about products that I don't fucking care for. I'm never going to use. But a lot of the times, if I'm like passionate about a product, I will 100% reach out to, I'll le reach out to people on LinkedIn. I'll reach out to people on Twitter. I'll DM them. They'll probably turn me down. They'll leave me on red. You know, like even despite the, the number of followers we have across the platforms, like I expect to be left on red more often than not, but I got no problem reaching out to companies to try to sign them. What do you think is the ideal followership? It, I guess, I mean, we're talking about YouTube. Let's just talk about YouTube right now, and we'll talk about others. But on YouTube, how many subscribers to get to that point, really? And you were doing a CPA deal. Um, so really, like, you could do that without, like, it's just a matter of converting. So I, I would think about it from uh, two different ways. If you are someone who's built a, a more of a community, and I know a lot of, everyone thinks they build, they've built a community. Yeah. And that's not, that's not the case. And I, one of my very good friends, my friend Noah, who does tech reviews, tech and fitness reviews. He has like 22,000 subscribers on his YouTube channel, does super high quality content, but he feels like I have, he's like, I haven't built my community because he is putting out videos that don't tell a story. They mm. are product reviews. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And it's like, those views come from people like that pop, that, that uh, product got popular. I'm going to search it. I want to buy it. Let me watch this guy's video. I am not now ingrained in his community. I'm not right. like ingrained in his story. I don't know who he is. So I think if you have a community, if you've built a story around yourself, you built a brand, you can be well off very early on. I think you could be legitimately a full-time content creator with between 10 and 15,000 YouTube subscribers. You sell one product that is anywhere from 30 to $60 and you get a high volume of purchasers, you can do really well doing that and scrap together. You could be like a freelance content creator where it's like, I sell a product, I sell a membership, I work with some sponsors, I got some AdSense. Like you piece together six different, I guess, revenue streams that may all be small. Yep. Maybe you have one that's bigger or whatever to make the ultimate salary, to make the ultimate 50, 60, 70 K that yeah. you're looking to get. So I think if you're not community based, it's going to be a lot harder for you. You're going to have to have a larger number, but if you are community based, if you built a story, if you've built a brand, people want to support you. So I think you could do it with a much smaller number. And I feel like we talk about community and we talked about caps off in the last podcast, but just the, you feel the engagement. Yeah. So 10,000 followers here isn't the same thing as 10,000 followers there. It's a matter of how loyal are they? And I, I mentioned this in another podcast that I did, but I heard this years ago when I was working at LA Fitness as a, like, uh, I was selling personal training or whatever. And my boss told me, he was like, first people buy you and then they buy your product. Yep. So at the point where you build that type of loyalty and uh, just following uh, that really, they're there for you and they're there for to, to watch you and, and really engage with you and they want to be a part of that. When you put something out, it's, it's like an extension of you. 100%. And they want to, uh, and they want to engage with that. But I think that's why it's so important to nail down the right affiliates as well, because the last thing you want to do is lose that follower, lose that that fan, that community member over a deal that they feel like you're selling out for. Hundred percent. And it's and it's also like th the affiliate deal is a reflection of you as well, right? Like you are in essence choosing to promote this thing and not this thing. And right. That's why I think being niche and being like you and and saying this is who i'm speaking to is the right way to go about it because then those people are super connected to you like you need to be vulnerable on camera like you need to show these people that you don't think you're better than them you are just 
speaking to them. You are speaking with them, not above them, down to them. And talk about your faults and talk about your flaws and and be biased when you want to be biased yep. and be annoying when you want to be annoying. Be sad when you want to be sad because that's how they also operate. So they're like, oh, this dude's just like me. Right. This dude's like me. I relate to him. He is now promoting this product. We're the same. Like, I'm probably going to like that too. It's all the way that you present yourself is literally just a reflection of you. The products that you sell, the brands that you work with, the fucking clothes you wear. It's just like, it's all a reflection of you. And if you are like holding back what you are, people could see that so easily. hundred percent. Yeah. It comes through the camera. Uh, so at that point where you had this big summer, yep. it's like a summer, right? Uh, summer was it just, was it just you? Summer 17, there was some good music that dropped that summer. Hell yeah, there was. I don't remember what it was, but I imagine I was jamming out pretty hard <laughs> at the time. Uh, yeah. It was just you? Did you have... I had. I definitely had like people helping me out, but I was putting out my own individual videos like five, six days a week. I was editing most of them. I had probably my first editor, I think, come on to the channel that summer. Full time? No, definitely not. It was just someone that reached out. That was Scott. Scott is like our... He doesn't work with us or help us really at all anymore, but he's still very much a part of the community. I'll always have so much love for Scott. Reach out. He was like, dude, I love what you're doing. I think this was probably when I had around 5,000 subs. Love what you're doing. Love the vlogs you're putting out. Love fantasy football. He was a he was a video editor. He was like the head video editor for, I think, Ford, like the car company. So he would make their commercials. Got it. Yeah, that's out huge. And he's like, I want to help out for free. So he did oh, videos for me for like six months, paid him like the little that I could. I was like, I'll pay you $5,000 next year or whatever. Um, and I never got to the point at there where I was like comfortable hiring people full time. Cause I was still like, I don't really know what I'm doing. I'm just right. like making videos, right. building a business here. Am I just like making a lot of money so that I could have fun in life? You know, I was still very much like figuring things out. Um, he was probably the first person I brought on contract wise, but I brought on many friends to make content with me mm. throughout the years, whether it was, uh, animal snacks or uh, Mike and Noah, you know, probably won't ring any bells for a lot of people out there, but many people I brought on as content creators, but no one was really full time until Tony when we got into the office space two years ago. So, what was the first thing you, the first thing you outsourced was editing, was video editing? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, that was like, and it, I didn't it's even crazy. really mind doing it at the time, yeah. but it took up so much it of my time. It takes up so much point. of your time. Yeah, where I was like, and now I'm like, I think, I don't even know if I hate editing, but I'm just like, I don't do it anymore. So I'm like, I don't ever want to get back into the game. It's like, once you get it out, I'm out. Well, it gets to the point where you look at what are you making and then what are you making per hour? And then you look at editors out there and what they cost per hour. Yeah. And then it's just like, you're just and, and it's throwing away money. Like, fortunately, I, I've been able to build something that people wanted to be a part of. And a lot of them will come to me. And I'm sure you guys got a million of these DMs like, hey, I want to be a part of what you're doing. Like, yeah, what, yeah. what can I do for you? Totally. And, and my answer was always like, dude, I don't have anything open, but like, you want to edit this shit, be my guest. And they'll be like, I don't know how to edit. It's like, then you can't really help me. So it was sink or swim for a lot of them. And that's exactly how Tony got on the team. He reached out and he was like, what can I do? And I was like, ah, right time, right place. When you emailed me, like, here's this thing. You want to edit it? Got it back. I was like, this is pretty fucking good. Like he worked hard on this. He yeah. was really resourceful. Just Kept slowly building that, put a little bit more work on his plate, put a little bit more work on his plate. That's how Sexy Pats got into the picture here. He was like, I want to be part of it. I'll fucking edit it. I'll do your TikToks. I was like, that was what I needed. So it's like when you want to be a part of something that you see kind of on the upswing, you have to figure out what it is that they want and, and deliver it to them. Alex Ramosi talks about it, that obviously he get all these people will get a lot of uh, messages all the time in their DMs like, yo, I, can I edit your stuff or whatever? And you're at the point now where it's like, dude, edit my stuff for me, send it to me, and I'll look and see if it's good. And if it's good, like, you got to provide the value. To, because he talks about how, dude, it takes time for me to even think about what am I going to give you to edit. Dude, so that's my time. A hundred percent. And I was, dude, I was actually thinking about this this morning because a kid reached out to me. A kid emailed me, and he was like, I have a proposal for you. And I was like, all right, I'm like kind of interested. And then it was like a basic email that was like, uh, you know, I do this work. Like, I want to work for you guys. And he was like, I attached a video down below. So I was like, okay, I'm going to click the video and watch it to see what he did. Landed very short. Like, there was nothing really to the video. But I'm like, that just surpassed. When I see the video attachment in the email, that just surpassed 99% of emails. Right. Had he done something, had he been like, yo, I made this video for you, and it was good work, 
I'm like, oh, how can I ignore that at this point? Yeah. The easiest way to get a job is just do the thing that you're trying. Don't say you're going to do the thing or you can do the thing. Just do it. And I promise you, none of us who you're trying to get a job from are going to bypass that. If right. you do the thing for us, like you're watching this podcast right now and you want to edit for Felipe, make four clips from this podcast right now, send it to Felipe, and he's going to be like, fuck, those are pretty good. What I'll am be I happy, bro. Right. Like that, that is how the world works now. Get your foot in the door by literally kicking the fucking door down. What was that service that they were, that this guy was offering you? He was like, I love football. I, I'm a great salesman. I'm like, I just like, what am I going to do with that? <laughs> when did this become a business for you? Because yeah, you're outsourcing in the beginning. You're just, yeah, I can help. I can have some help editing and stuff like that. When did it become like, I want this to be a business? Was at that point, were you BDGE already? Yeah. We had, okay. um, well, in my mind, we had like built a brand behind BDG because yeah. then we started getting my friends into the content creation. Okay, so at that's that point, when I was like, okay, when other people are starting to be on camera, then yeah. that's when we're like calling it BDG. Got the it. Channel was still under my name at the time. Yeah, but like people knew us as BDG because that was like our graphics. That was like what we went yeah. by, whatever. Um, and then. I started looking at it as a business. Like BDG to me was always a brand. It yeah. was just like what we what we were together. Right. When we were together, we were BDG, right? Yeah. Company, I made that I made that switch in my mind when we got the office space two years ago. I said we're gonna get an office space. I'm gonna to hire people full time. Create content and stuff like that. To create content, to get more infrastructure, to be face to face. Cause that was one of the problems is like two of my friends that I was filming with weekly lived in Jersey while I was living in Brooklyn and it was like we never had meetings together we never had you know whatever yeah. so we showed up and i was like this content just falls flat because we don't do anything to make it better and i was like i hope getting the office together would be the thing that like pulls us together so when we did that i was like okay people are now invested just as much as i am they are spending 50 60 70 hours a week working on the same thing that i am therefore it is no longer just mine it is other people's as well so it's a business so now nick Colano is an employee of BDGE mm. and everything I'm doing is to try to eventually, hopefully separate myself a little bit. I, I love being on content. So I don't imagine like I won't separate myself for the sake of doing it, but I think it's probably the right thing for the business over the long term. but I love making content. So I'll always be on camera, I think, but I think I made that mindset shift when I was like, all right, we have money. I feel, I feel comfortable financially. I feel like we have the right people in place. And then, you know, all hell broke loose over the last fucking two years and, bunch of shit happened but like that's how i got to where i am now it might have been the last podcast now i don't even know they're blending into me but you talked about building products i think it was the last one you're so focused on products now yeah. it all started in the beginning when you created the draft guide but what's the future for bdge and where are you taking the business now yeah it's a great question we actually brought on a cto uh, chief technology officer for those. I said, I said, so one of my boys the other day, I think I mentioned CTO. He's like, that sounds like a fake job. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. So JL is our CTO. And I had met JL from through the fantasy industry, you know, four or five years ago. And I was just like, man, I I've worked with developers and software engineers throughout the years. And I was like, I've always had kind of a bad experience with them. They've always been a little bit difficult to work with just because there's a communication barrier. Yeah, totally. How we see things and how they can actually turn them into real life. I've always had a lot of trouble communicating with them. So I was like, man, I need someone. And he's a, he's a coder. He's a full stack software engineer. I was like, I need someone I could trust, someone that I could communicate to, someone that I feel is like a friend of mine to be on the team. So we negotiated for a long time to get him onto the team. And I was just like, I just want you to be part of the team. He's like, I want to be the CTO. I was like, sure, I don't care. I don't care what your title yeah, is. Yeah, I just yeah. like want you on the team. So that was his suggestion. I, to be completely honest, I feel silly saying that a lot of the time. I'm like, I don't really need a CTO. I don't really need to be calling you a CTO. That, f that feels a little bit crazy, but he is our tech, our product guy. So we are building out a brand new infrastructure for the website where the draft guy will be housed, where we'll have way more um, straight line access to our audience, to the numbers of our audience and build out more tools and hopefully eventually build out like an actual software engineering team. So we'll become part media business, part software, like a SaaS company in a sense, yeah. which I think, I think the companies that are really going to win over the next 10 years are the combination of SaaS and media, right? Like the ones yeah. who could build cool things online right. and also have a front facing presence. So people right. can know, like at the end of the day, it's like a, a, a company has product and they have distribution. Like mm. Those are the only two 
piece of the equation in a business. You have the product that you built and then you have how you're getting it out to people. Social media people have the distribution. Right. Totally. People have the product. The ones that are going to win are the ones that have both. Right. Like, cause then you got the pipeline to the audience. Then you got the product, whatever you can get feedback simultaneously. Um, so that's what we're building towards and going back to the branches of what we're building fantasy dynasty gambling. Yeah. Trivia. Again, we're trying to make sure that we have those systems in place for all of them so that when we've done it four times, we're like, okay, we know, we know how to, we know the right systems for content. We know the right products and services to build out. We know how to build a community, you know, discord, different systems of it so that, okay, passion number five now just hits our plate. Like this new thing just goes crazy. Let's just throw that into our system, throw that into our infrastructure new content creator, new editor, new software engineer. We already have the rules in place for it. So that's long-term vision of like, we're almost building out the playbook for creator-led businesses to scale. I absolutely love that. And like you said, just creating a lot of content, showing that process. I think that's what makes you guys so cool. And it's what makes you guys personable. It makes it easier to buy from you guys because like we know exactly what you're doing and what you're building. And so many people talk about that. So as far as somebody wanting to replicate that because I think if somebody listens to this podcast, they're like, they got this dream vision now. They're like, I can do what Nick did. And now we're here in this office. It's sick. You know, you got all the, you got your, it's your high school helmet, right? Yeah. Put it on Definitely not a Calvin Ridley right before he got suspended helmet. (laughs) (laughs) That's just sick. Um, yeah. So how would you go about if you were starting from scratch Mm. and doing this from the beginning? Because now we're looking at big picture and what you've done, but you talk about this a lot about that initial fear of just getting on camera. Yeah. And that's really like the, the really, really beginning. You get down to the crux of it, dude. Like that's where, uh, that's where a lot of people just die. It's 95% of people who could be great. I think just die right there. Cause they don't let the, they don't, they don't let themselves like dream and, and get out there. And like you, ha- you have a vision in your head. And it's like, you could literally just make that reality. But I would say, I've been really fortunate that I've always been a really patient person. Like mm. when I saw the Max Tunis and the Christian Guzmans and I was like, I could do that. Never in my mind was I was like, I could do that next year. I right. could do that in two years. I was always like, I'm just going to do that. I'm going to go after it and I'll get there eventually. And that would be my mindset again. It would be like, okay, I have to figure, I got to reverse engineer my life at this point. Like if I had to start over tomorrow, no one knew who I was. I had $0 in my bank account, didn't have this office, didn't have relationships with any of these people. I would have to get a job but I would work again the way that I worked when I was 21 years old, which was 6 p.m. to 2 a.m. making my content, editing, because I believe I believed I had a message to give to the world. You know what I mean? Like I believed down in my heart. And if I had to start tomorrow, I would go down the same path that you're going down right now. This type of content is the only thing I would focus on because that's what I love right now. That's what yeah. I'm really passionate about. Like you could probably hear it in my voice where it's like fantasy and, and football and that stuff became a job for me over the years. Yeah. You know, after doing it for eight years, you're like, there are, bigger things in life than, than what I was, what I'm doing. And it's just a part of evolving as a person. I think I just totally fell a little bit out of love with it, but now it is my business and I love the aspect of building it and branding right. and marketing. And now I love talking about that shit. So yeah. it's like, if I, if I woke up tomorrow and I had nothing to do, I would make videos just like this. That's what I would do. Cause I love doing that shit. Um, but how would I do it again? I would go into it knowing that it's going to take me 10 fucking years to do it again. Cause it just took me 10 years to get to where we are. I think that's the difference between people who fail and people who have success. Because if you have that long-term vision in, in mind, then you don't burn out. Like, burnout's not a thing right. without, without reasonable expectations. Yeah, it's like Gary Vee always says this. He's like, you move really slow in the macro, but really fast in the micro. It's like, you know the big picture thing, but I've never put pressure. Like, dude, honestly, I feel like I'm just getting started. I'm like, we are, no, yeah. I have a million different things I want to do. And in 10 years from now, we better be 10x what we are right now. And that's how I felt when I was starting. And I'm sure I'm going to feel that way again in 10 years because it's just like, I love doing it. Yeah, totally. It's it's not, there was never anything I wanted to get to. I was inspired by what they were doing and I knew I could do it. And I'm like, this is, this shit like never really hits me to be honest with you. Yeah. Cause this has been a steady evolution of, of the 10 years of doing this day in and day out. But I'd go in with a very patient mindset. I'd probably be scared as fuck again if I've never done it before. Totally. But it, but it's like, what other choice do you have? You're going to live an unhappy life for your whole life without being able to fully fucking express yourself? Is there a, is there a potential to be happy in a nine to five? In a nine to five? At, being an employee. Because I think what you talk about, you're, a big message I've gotten from you is, is you needing that fulfillment of your, your day-to-day, that, like, that drive, something that drives you in the, in the purpose. And even building the business, even when you fell out of love with sports, quote-unquote, 
the business around it, like building the business around that thing is still super invigorating for you and, and exciting for you. So one thing, and the reason I ask this question is because for me, I genuinely had those thoughts because I was like, I could jump to another company. Uh, I was unhappy at the game day and I, I was like, look, man, I, at one point I was, I was, I was happy. Like, and I got the six figures there pretty quickly because it was a startup and I was able to grow pretty quickly. And I was thankful for that. My first six figure uh, raise, cool, shiny object syndrome at first. After a little bit of time, it, that wears off immediately. There's just nothing. It's very easy to say it from where we're sitting now. Money has never, ever once wavered a decision that I've ever made as it relates to the business. And I actually think that's probably why we're here is because money does not affect the decision. Yeah. It's easy to say like, oh, yeah, like you take these these choices. But I, I, I stayed at home living with my mom, making my content because I knew I had a longer term vision. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. my friends were all taking fucking high investment banking jobs in the city and yep. living really fun lives while they were 23, 24, 25. Sure. On the weekends, I'd be able to go hang out with them, fucking do whatever I had to do when I was young. I was sitting at home, like still living with my mom, yeah, yeah. making YouTube videos when I had a thousand subscribers, 400 subscribers. Like that was the guy I was. And I was like, this is not me. This is just a fucking step in the journey of becoming who I was. Right. So, Easy to look back and say it now, but you get to that hundred thousand uh, dollar mark and you realize it's like, oh, okay, now I just step back and look at my life. That's literally it. And I think I told myself uh, even before that, I was like, look, dude, I love working in sports. Like, I, I love if I could just hang out, watch sports, I'm not really working. And then if I can get paid well doing it, great. And then I got to that point and I realized I wasn't being pushed anymore. I wasn't being challenged. Well, that's the thing. Like, going back to the last conversation we had about, you know, you're working at the game day and at some point, if you guys got mad about something, it became oh, us versus the game day where I think you can for sure be happy being an employee of someone if you believe in the cause that you're building or gotcha. if you believe in the person that you're working for, if you believe in what you guys are doing together, for sure. And I mean, that that's that's how I hope the rest of the guys that work with me feel. Absolutely. You know what I think is difficult, though? And, and like you're a business owner and you got different people working for you and, and everything like that. So you can speak to it more than me. Uh, well, from that side of it, I can speak at it to it from the other side, uh, which you can as well. But for me, um, I feel like you, what happened with me was my growth outpaced what the company was able to give me. Got you. And yeah, I could jump to another role potentially that is going to have more challenges for me and is going to continue to drive my growth. But that's not guaranteed. You have to find that job. There's all that kind of stuff. So I think in the ideal world, there's always going to be a good job. There's going to be a, the perfect quote unquote job, but it's going to be very hard to line that up with you. It's like destiny. Like, yeah, could you find your, your, your soulmate? Yeah, you can, but like, you know, it's going to be tougher than you're not just going to look right there and find it. It's going yeah, to be a it's journey. It's to find the right thing. It's very easy to find the wrong thing though. Right. And it's like, yeah. I think it's a lot easier to find the wrong thing and cut it out quickly. I think people have a problem cutting things out quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you know that you hate this fucking thing, yeah. you got a job for six weeks and you hate that shit, get out the job. You know, like right. I'm living proof of doing that. And I think a lot of people, again, go back to the, the fear of judgment. Like, oh, quitting my job again. Oh, like what is this person going to think? Oh, I'm not making any money right now because I'm thinking of maybe a longer term vision of what I'm doing. People find out what they don't like very quickly. They just don't act quickly on it. And I think that's a huge mistake. That would be like, Probably the number one piece of advice I can give to younger people is that when you find out something that for sure you want no part of, make yourself no part of it, dude. Like if, if, it, if it is a stepping stone to get to something else, you're like, okay, this is the job I want, but I do totally. have to have this position to get there. Fine. But if you're like, I'm going down this path without any idea of what's happening in the future and you just hate it, get the fuck out, man. We figure out what we want way quicker than what we do what we don't want quicker than what we do. I think I love that. I love that. Yeah. So I think it just comes down to being in the right environment. If, if you, if you're in an environment to grow and within a smaller company, I think, and you're providing these opportunities to those guys that work with you, you can assess directly th where they are. And if they're being maxed out, if they got more room to grow. And I think that for me, if I had that direct relationship with whoever was running the business at the time, right? Like, they could have been like, okay, like let's challenge you in different ways and let's reward you in those ways. I just think that for most people, there's only so many BDGEs. There's only so many snap, you know, snapback sports. So talent, talent acquisition. I think about this pretty often. Where one, it's it's tough to if, right now. It's tough to get in our doors. Of course, yeah. We have a lot of people that are reaching out all the time. Hey, can I do like what can I do for you? Again, that doesn't that doesn't get it done. Yeah, you gotta already have been doing it or show me that you could do it rather than telling me about it. 
and, and, and vice versa. Like I'm thinking about a lot of the, the lifestyle content we put out, the vlog content we put out, this type of content goes a really long way for talent acquisition and people wanting to be a part of what we're building. Cause again, it's front facing. I'm showing you who I am. You're seeing who you'd be working for, or at least what you'd be believing in and believing in what you'd be working for long term. And that I think goes a long way with having people want to work for you. And listen, I show up knowing that like these talented kids, we might be a stepping stone for them. I've had yeah. a conversation with them. They're like, they come on as interns and I'm like, Hey, I want you to be a part of what we're doing. You might, that, that might not be your forever plan, but like we could both provide each other value. If that's the way we see it, like, let me teach you for the next two years of how to be a full-time content creator. That means leaving afterwards. I'm not gonna be mad at you. Like that's just part of what we're doing here. You want talented people to come work for you. I got, I got a fucking newsflash for you. Talented people want to go do their own thing too. Yeah. You know, like who would I be to hold someone down? Cause if I was in their position and I wanted to like be great and I had someone that I thought was like mentoring me and they were like, they got mad at me for wanting to do my own thing. I'd be like, damn, you're a fucking fraud. Like that would be my totally. first thought, you know? So like, I would never have that mindset to them. I want to help them achieve whatever goals they want. I just think a lot of the time you could do that together. You help build BG, totally. I'll help build you. When we have to go our separate ways, we go our separate ways and it is what it is. I think something about the content business and just being a smaller business, working directly with those guys, it's so much easier to do because you're letting your guys build their personal brands. Yeah. And so they're here and they understand what they're getting from that. So that's, that's dope. Yeah. There's, what, there's, there's sometimes that like, I go back and forth because a lot of these, a lot of these guys, it's their first, like, uh, I think it's literally all their first corporate jobs. Which is sick, bro. Which, which, which like, at, at some parts, I'm like, man, sometimes I feel like maybe I'm too lenient. Like, they don't really know what the other side is like. Right. So maybe I do have to crack the hammer down or crack the whip down, whatever, a little bit more and 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 show them that like okay and, and these guys are very self aware like yeah, the ones yeah, that I'm yeah. working in the office with now I don't really have the problems with but I think about that sometimes cause totally we got a young crew like yeah, yeah, Tony's yeah. like the oldest behind me and he's like 25 years old yeah, like, yeah the rest yeah. of them are like 21 22 23 right. which I love because they got good energy they got drive right. they got work ethic all that kind of stuff but there's they haven't seen the other side whereas like I have you have totally and that also drives you a little bit a hundred percent know what the other grass is 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 like and it's a different color. Uh, what do you think is the biggest reason most creators fail? Fear of judgment. I think everybody could be awesome. Like, I think everyone's super creative. I think everybody can provide something really cool to the world. But they, like, we live in a world where creativity is almost, like, shunned upon. Unless you're, if you're made already, then people like your creativity. But they don't like you building it up at the start. Because it's this idea that, oh, fuck, you're doing it. You're just showing me that I'm not doing it. So right. I feel bad and I'd rather just bring you down because it's easier for me to do that. So most creators fail, I think, because they are scared to like truly let it go. Some creators can can make it by being 70% of themselves, but there's a talent spectrum there. Like if you're 70% and you're really talented, you might make it. But a lot of people are just scared to really let it all fall out. And I think if they were, their ideas would be really cool. And I feel like if they did that, if they understood, if they stopped caring about that judgment, then now you're not... The judgment creates that expectation that you need to have success right now or else you're not going to be able to... But that's like, only from people who will never be... Like, I would yeah, never yeah, have yeah. that judgment on a creator because I know what it fucking takes. So the only people you're getting that judgment from are, are from insecure people that will never be in your spot. Right, absolutely. You know, it's, like, it's like you got to know that as soon as you feel hate or as soon as you feel that type of energy towards you, understand it's, it's literally only coming from people that are feeling shitty. It's a straight reflection of themselves about how they feel about themselves. It's never about you. Agreed. All right, we're going to get into this last segment real quick. I'm going to, it's called cutting through the bullshit, all right? All right, Dan. I'm going to ask you whether something is bullshit or truth, sure. all right? The first, anybody can create content. Truth. Any hesitance there? Uh, I was trying to see if I could find an example of someone okay. that I believed couldn't. I mean, I'm sure there are physical capabilities. Yeah, possible, <laughs> sure. But again, it goes back to the yeah, yeah, yeah. if you let it rip, if you're, right if there. you're really like, Put the draws down. I think anybody could do it. Just like that. All right. Uh, you can create content about anything. For sure. I think I, the piece of advice I give to new content creators is like when you find the niche that you want to make a piece of content about or you want to start creating about, take a piece of paper, write down 30 how-tos. How to this, how to that, how to whatever within that niche because then it gets you into the value giving mindset you don't have to make the videos about that mm. but it gets you right into that mindset of like what what could i teach people like only write totally. down things that you feel like you'd be able to have a conversation with a one-on-one -on -one person and teach them how to do that thing you write down 30 of those and you have a really good idea about what you know and i think you could probably do that for any industry or niche 
Totally. It's, yeah. It goes back to Gary Vee. Do you know Upper Hand Fantasy or no? Upper on Instagram? Hand. I Big think, Instagram account. Yeah, he's been on your on Capital. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what? We've DM back and forth. I actually played in a fantasy league with him, I think. Oh, he's, yeah, he's yeah. dope. He's a, he's a dope guy. And he was saying that exact thing, man. I mean, he got – Gary V was the one who got him to get started. He's a software engineer, still is actually. Does his full-time job, and he's, it pays him, and he doesn't have to work – like do that much for him, so maybe I, maybe I have to have a deeper conversation with him. Then. <laughs> Get him on the fucking team. <laughs> hey, maybe talk to him. I'm but looking for engineers. He yeah. said he said that same thing, man. I just think it rings so true. You always hear it. Gary Vee's like, yeah, you can start content about anything, but he was like literally that. Um, you can build a podcast by just getting any major celebrity on it. Build a podcast. Well, I would I would say depends what your definition of building a podcast is. I think you can, you can grow one. You can grow. Fo- you can grow. You can grow f- your follower count, but you cannot grow your community that yeah. way. I think there's a difference between I, – I, I think I tweeted something similar to this where it's like you can rush knowledge, but you can't rush wisdom. You can rush a follower count, but you can't rush, like, loyalty to your brand. You can – like, those are things that just take time because it takes you, – you can't have the thing without the bad in front yeah, of you. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, you, in order to build a story, you have to have bad parts of it, right? right. Otherwise, it's not a, an actual story, and people only fall in love with real stories. So, therefore, no bad, no story, no story, no love. I feel like that's with all these growth hacks. Like, if you're on, like, TikTok, it, like, when, whenever anything comes out, like, a new feature for the app, like, you can use it, and, it, yeah, it'll, it'll drive your following, but, like, at the end of the day – True growth is building that community, as you alluded to earlier. If you feel like you're not making content that just straight up is like helping people, if it's not like something in your core and you're like going out there to help people and give people value, all that tacticy shit is not going to help you. Uh, the only way to stand out with content, I know the answer to this. Some mm-hmm. people have said the other way, though. The only way to stand out in content is with controversial takes. Nah, of course not. I think uh, you could stand out in a million ways. I think you could stand out. Via being on the right platform at the right time. I think you can stand out via, you know, your production. I think you can totally. stand out by your voice. I think you can stand out by your looks. You could stand out now, in a million different ways. Now, do you think controversy helps? I think it helps. I think it helps you grow followers. Yeah. Uh, again, that's never like. That doesn't necessarily equal doesn't, community. Yeah, correct. And that that's like, I would never advocate one of my guys make content to make it controversial. Like I would never back up and say like, Hey, let's make this because I feel like it's going to get people fired up in the wrong way. <laughs> right, right. If it doesn't sit right with me, I don't want to put it out as content. Totally. Uh, only experts should have a podcast. We got that one a lot, man. <laughs> Caps off. They're like, yo, <laughs> uh, no, definitely not. But it's like only experts should have a podcast, but it's like, it almost feels like the people like you look at people that have podcasts as experts now. So it's like they also started with the zero. Right. So it's like they shouldn't have had one at the time. So uh, who, who's an expert, I think, is really what it really comes down to. Yeah, who's an expert? Um, no, I mean, that's just not true. Like anyone could find anyone entertaining. Anyone could find anyone yeah, valuable. Yeah. Like this person's not going to find me to be an expert, but I'm also going to be this person's favorite podcast in the world. Totally. So it's like, dumbass. <laughs> Podcasts are oversaturated. Um. Well, actually, let, let's break down because you you reference podcasts a lot, but yeah. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. When I think of podcasts, I'm I think of long form That's audio it. on yeah. Apple iTunes or Apple Podcasts sure. or Spotify. Yeah. I know you think of it like the video component to it. Yeah. Like the TikTok component to yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. So overall, like content, of course, is not oversaturated. You can right. you could put content out anywhere. Podcasts themselves. I wouldn't say are oversaturated, but it is one of the platforms. Like there are only a handful of platforms you could post content on, or like written, audio, visual, whatever. Sure. Podcasting happens to be like one of the nine major. Podcasting is like also one of the few that make it really hard to grow organically. Right? Oh yeah, there's only a few like YouTube you can grow organically, TikTok of course, and all the short form ones, the Instagram Reels and the YouTube Shorts. The other ones are relatively hard to grow organically. So if I were giving advice, if someone's like, I want to start a podcast, I would say. You should probably, as long as you're not like deathly terrified of video, probably do video because those platforms lend themselves to growing organically, whereas yeah. podcasting really doesn't. Yeah, I would answer to that, that you shouldn't do a podcast without video. So then you can just repurpose it in a lot of different ways. Yeah. Um, I think it's, I had, I had a guest on yesterday, Jack Cody. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but uh, he said that like, yeah, tech, I guess it's oversaturated. There's a lot of podcasts out there, but like, if you don't have a podcast nowadays, like, you don't have anything. Yeah. So you need to you need to have one. It's like oversaturation doesn't necessarily equal bad. Right, and it doesn't like you having a podcast does not 
mean it needs to be a successful podcast. And I'll give you an example. We just launched our dynasty um, side of things within our company, and we brought on two creators, not full time, but they're contractors, and we're, you know we're paying them real money that mm-hmm. they were not going to be making off of YouTube or whatever. Both of them were already making content on YouTube. One of them had eight hundred subscribers. And I'm like, this is not a big account. He is not bringing any leverage to us. He's not bringing followers to us. But he had been creating for a year straight. His production quality was very high. You just need to, if you're building long form on YouTube, it's going to take a long time. Totally. And I was like, this kid has it. Yeah. I know that. I see right. it with the 800 subs. Yeah. Just let me give you the platform for this. So a lot of people only, they, they think of content creation, full-time content creation, like so black or white. Like if I start a podcast, it has to blow up. If I do this, it has to do this. It's like, nah, like this kid is now going to make, I don't know, fifteen twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a year off of me paying him to make a few videos yeah. a week. And again, it goes back to like the whole freelance content creation style where that might be part of his income. Now, maybe he sells his own product. Maybe he gets some AdSense. Before you know it, he made 40, 70, fucking 60K this year. And it's like, you can piece together different parts and become a creator for another brand or another company or whatever. I love it, bro. That was that was the last thing. So I ask everybody this right before we close out. Uh, we definitely got a good sense of what you're striving for overall, uh, everything you're building towards just by this whole conversation that was very thorough. But if you had to sum it up in one sentence and you can look at it how you want to, three years, five years, yeah. overall goal um, for your life, like what you want to do, uh, what are you striving for right now? In the physical sense, I would like to eventually have this place. And, and we're kind of in beta for that, yeah. I guess, if you look at it holistically. I want this to be a creative space where anyone can come in and podcast and use the equipment like we literally are yeah, right yeah, now yeah. kind of thing and, and not feel weird doing that, like be an open, welcome environment because, I, again, I think a lot of people stop themselves before even starting because they're scared. But if you can come into an environment where everybody's doing it, it's a lot less fear invoking to do it. Totally. So that is my ultimate goal is to create an environment like that because I think back like when I make content – Realistically, I think I'm speaking to my 20-year-old self. I think I'm making content for my 20, 18, yeah. 21-year-old self because he was so fucking scared. And I wish right. I had me speaking to me, being like, it's cool to be scared. It's okay to be vulnerable. Yeah. It's okay to be a fucking idiot at the time. Like, you got to work through these things. So ultimately, like on a day-in, day-out basis, that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to make content for the younger me to hopefully help younger me's, you know? But overall, I want to create that space. And I think doing that day in and day out will eventually create that product overall. I love it, bro. Plug your uh, socials where people can find you. Yeah, so uh, we have just BDG across the platforms if you're into NFL, football, fantasy football, that kind of stuff. And then on the big content YouTube channel, I do a lot of video stuff that is relevant to this audience, branding, marketing, um, Hell yeah. podcasting, etc. Love it, bro. Thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. Thank you.